Uh, welcome to Tesla's second quarter 2021 Q&A webcast. I'm joined today by Elon Musk, Zachary Kirkhorn, and a number of other executives. Our Q2 results were announced at about 1 p.m. Pacific time in the update deck we published at the same link as this webcast. So to recap, Q2 2021 was a record quarter on many levels. We achieved record production, deliveries, and surpassed over a billion dollars in gap netting for the first time in Tesla history. I'd really like to congratulate everyone at Tesla for an amazing job. This is really an incredible milestone. It also seems that public sentiment towards EVs is at an inflection point. I think almost everyone agrees that uh, electric vehicles are the only way forward. Regarding supply chain, while we're making cars at full speed, the global chip shortage situation remains quite serious. For the rest of this year, our growth rate will be determined by the slowest part in our supply chain, which there, there are a wide range of chips that are at various times the slowest part in the supply chain. I mean, it's worth noting that if we had everything else, if we had a uh, fast numbers of vehicles and cells, we would not be able to make them. Uh, if everything except the chips, we wouldn't be able to make them. The, the chip, chip supply is fundamentally a governing factor on our uh, output. It is difficult for us to say how long this will last because we, we don't have, this is out of our control essentially. It does seem like it's getting better, but it's hard to predict. In, in fact, e even achieving the output that we did achieve was only due to an immense effort from people within Tesla who were able to substitute al alternative uh, chips and then write the firmware in a matter of weeks. It's done just a matter of swapping out a chip. You also have to rewrite the software. It was uh, an incredibly intense effort, finding new chips, writing new firmware, integrating with the vehicle, and, and testing in order to maintain uh, production. And I'd also like to thank our suppliers uh, who worked with us. There have been many calls, you know, midnight, 1 a.m., just uh, with, with suppliers in resolving a lot of the uh, shortages. So thanks very much to our suppliers. In terms of FST subscription, we were able to launch full self-driving subscription last month. We, we expect it to, to build slowly, but then gather a lot of momentum over time. Obviously, we need to have the full self-driving build uh, widely available for it really to take off at a high rate. We're making a lot of progress there. I, I think FSD subscription will be a significant factor probably next year. With regard to Giga Texas and Giga Berlin, we're actually doing this earnings call from Giga Texas. So we're in the factory right now doing this earnings call. And the, the team has made incredible progress here. You can see the pictures online and see that there's basically nothing a year ago and there's a mostly complete large factory <laughs> a year later. So it's re really great work by the Giga Texas team and then also great, great work uh, in Berlin uh, or Brandenburg uh, with the, the team there. We expect to be producing the new, new design of the Model Y in both factories in limited production later this year. It, it's always like, it, it's hard to sort of explain to people who have not been through the agony of a manufacturing ramp, like why can't you just turn it on and make 5,000 a week? It is so hard to, to do manufacturing, it is so hard to do production. First approximation, there are 10,000 unique parts and processes that have to work, and the rate of growth of production goes as fast as the least lucky and, and dumbest of those 10,000 things. Um, and a bunch of them are not even in our control. So <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, it's insanely difficult. I'm fond of saying that prototypes are easy, and production is hard. And arguably the, the really remarkable thing that Tesla has done is not, not to make an electric car or to be a, a car startup because there have been hundreds of car startups uh, in the United States uh, and outside the United States. The thing that's remarkable is that Tesla didn't go bankrupt in, in reaching volume production. That's the amazing part because everyone else did because they all thought the prototype or the idea was the, the, the hard part and it is not. It is trivial by comparison with actual production. It's always worth noting that of, of all the American car companies, there are only two that have not gone bankrupt, and that is Ford and Tesla. The seeds of defeat are sown on the day of victory, and we must be careful that we do not do that. Look at history. So often, uh, the seeds of defeat are sown on the day of victory. We will endeavor not to make that the case at Tesla. So, let's see. The, the Model Y is in Texas, and made in Texas in Berlin. will look very much like the Model Ys we currently make, but the, there are substantial improvements in the difficulty of manufacturing. So, for example, the Model Y made here and in Berlin will have a cast front body and a cast rear body, whereas the one in California has cast rear body but not a cast front body. We're also aiming to do a structural pack with 4680 cells, which is a mass reduction and a cost reduction. But we're not counting on that as the only way to make things work. We have a sort of a backup plan with, with a non-structural pack, 2170s essentially. But at scale production, we obviously want to be using 4680s and a structural pack. From a physics standpoint, this is the best architecture. And from an economic standpoint, it is the lowest cost way to go. So the light is lowest cost. But there's a lot of new technology there, so it is difficult to predict with precision, when does it work and when do you reach scale production? And Drew's going to talk a bit more about the 4680 production. We are making great progress on the 4680 cells, but, but there are there is a tremendous amount of innovation
activation that we're packing into, into that 4680 cell. And so it's not simply a, a sort of minor improvement on state of the art. There are, and we went through this on the battery cell day, you know, half a dozen major improvements and dozens of, of small improvements. I think it will be great, but it's difficult to say when the last of the, of, of the technical challenges will be solved. So in conclusion, our team continues to make huge efforts to make our factories run at full speed, which is very difficult. Um, we have had some uh, factory shutdowns due to uh, part shortages, uh, and we hope those will be uh, relieved in the, in the coming weeks and months. We're making great progress on full self-driving. Some of the progress is not easy to see because it is at, at sort of a foundational software level, and so then it ends up being sort of a two steps forward, one step back situation. But over time, if you do two steps forward, one step back, and keep going, you do move forward. I'm, I'm highly confident that uh, the cars will be capable of full self-driving. If they have a full self-driving computer, the cameras, I'm confident that they will be able to drive themselves with the safety level substantially greater than that of the average person. Once again, thanks to all of our employees who are making this a, a, a breakthrough year for Tesla and an incredible quarter. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. And we have some follow-up remarks from Zachary Kirkhorn. Just to reiterate, Q2 was a great quarter for the Tesla team with strong improvements across the business. In particular, auto gross profit and margin, excluding credit, increased substantially. This was primarily driven by better cost optimization across our factories, good execution against our cost reduction plans, as well as increases in production and delivery volume. There was some benefit from pricing action, mostly in North America. However, it was small in the context of the other contributors. Note that the Model S and X program was at a slight loss for the quarter due to the relatively low volume. And supply chain challenges, including expedites, continued to provide cost headwinds. Additionally, it's encouraging to see the progress made on profitability within our energy and services and other businesses. While there's some benefit to looking at our progress quarter over quarter, I find it more helpful to look at progress over a slightly long-term horizon. Over the last two years, our vehicle delivery volumes have more than doubled. This volume increase was made possible by a steady decrease in ASPs, of more than 10%, driven by a roadmap to increase affordability and shifting mix towards our more affordable vehicles. Yet over that same period of time, our auto gross margin, excluding credit, has increased nearly 10 percentage points to our highest yet since the introduction of Model 3. This is only possible because our average cost per vehicle has reduced by more than the reduction in average price. This is a remarkable achievement in the context of the volume growth and ASP reduction as mentioned, and a testament to the hard work by the Tesla team. Additionally, OPEX has percentage of revenue has declined, and in particular SG&A, representing the work we've done to become more efficient as we scale the company while still making the required R&D investments to support our future. As a result, our gap operating margins have risen from negative to double digit in line with what we have guided. By managing our overhead costs and driving higher volumes, our P&L is benefiting from the marginal profitability of each incremental unit. Or said differently, we are recognizing the benefits of scale and improved fixed cost absorption. With strong operating cash flows and cash balance, we are putting that cash to use. CapEx continues to tick up, primarily driven by capacity investments in Austin, Berlin, and Shanghai. Additionally, each quarter we are using our cash to retire legacy debt, which was taken on at a time when interest rates and company risk were much higher than in today's environment. As I've mentioned before, our 2021 volumes will skew towards the second half of the year as we push for continued sequential increases in volume. Despite the great work so far managing the instability of the supply chain, these challenges remain and are unfortunately increasing in pain with a higher volume. As we work through the uncertainty, we want to ensure we do our best to manage customer wait times as well as the impact these interruptions have on our employees and costs. And as Elon mentioned, volume growth will be determined by part availability as we have the factory capacity ready and are in a strong demand position. Now let's go to the retail investor questions on say.com. The, the first question from Robert M is uh, Tesla's website still says Cybertruck production is expected to begin in late 2021. Can Tesla share more details on the current status of the Cybertruck and confirm if production is still expected? Sorry, we cut out there for a second. Um, yeah, the Cybertruck is currently in its alpha stages. We finished basic engineering architecture of the vehicle. With the Cybertruck, we're redefining how the vehicle is to be made. As Elon said, it carries much of the structural pack and large casting designs of the Model Y being built in Berlin and Austin. Obviously, those take priority over the Cybertruck, but we are moving into the beta phases of Cybertruck later this year, and um, we'll be looking to ramp that in production in uh, Giga, Texas, after uh, Model Y is up and going. Yeah, it's just worth reemphasizing that the, the, 
is the extraordinary difficulty of, of ramping uh, production of large manufactured items. At risk of being repetitive, it is it's actually easy to make prototypes or sort of handle small volume production, but uh, anything produced at, at high volume, which is really what's, what's relevant here, is it, it's going to move as fast as the slowest of the, say, at rough order of magnitude, 10,000 unique parts and processes. And so you could have 9,999, <laughs> but just one is missing. I mean, we were missing, for example, like a big struggle this quarter was the module that controls the airbags and the seatbelts. <laughs> and obviously, you cannot ship a car without those. And, and that, that, uh, that limited our production uh, severely uh, worldwide in Shanghai and in Fremont. It like, wouldn't have mattered if we had like 17 different car models because we, they all need the airbag module. <laughs> so it's just irrelevant. In, in order for Cybertruck and Semi to scale to volume that's meaningful for customer deliveries, we, we've got to solve the, the chip shortage uh, or you know, working with our suppliers. People sometimes say, why don't you just build a chip fab? Okay, well, okay, that would take us, you know, even moving like, like lightning, 12 to 18 months. So it's not like you can just whip up a chip fab. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, I'll just make a quick chip fab. It is quite a trial dealing with all of the constraints of scaling a large manufactured object. I, I think it may be the case that Tesla is is scaling. It, it, it is, it's, I think we might be the fastest in history ever for scaling a large manufactured object. I think maybe the Model T would have been comparable back in the day, uh, the Ford Model T. Probably the internet knows the answer, but I, I think we may be scaling large manufactured objects at the, the fastest rate in history, or, or I'd like to know who did, did it faster <laughs> so we can learn from them. Um, so it's worth just noting that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's not bad. The Cybertruck and Semi, actually both are heavy users of, of, of cell capacity, so we've got to make sure we have the cell capacity uh, for those two vehicles. Or it's, it's kind of pointless. We can make a small number of, of, of vehicles, but the, the, the effect of cost if you make a small number of vehicles is, is insane. Like they would literally cost, uh, you know, a million dollars a piece <laughs> or more. <laughs> and that, there's a reason why you do, do things at volume production, uh, which is to get the economies of scale that get the cost down. But we are, we are looking at a pretty massive increase in cell availability next year. But it's not like in January 1. It's, it's, it comes through, you know, it ramps up through the course of next year. Uh, even without Tesla cell production, we believe our suppliers will be able to deliver about twice as much cell output in next year as this year. Uh, Drew, do you want to talk more about that? Uh, yeah. Given concerns over cells bottleneck and growth, our target is to grow cell supply ahead of the 50% year-on-year year growth targets of the vehicle business and also enable increased energy storage deployments. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, our cell suppliers are tracking to double their production in 2022. It's worth noting, like, if you have a target of, of, of a certain number, that doesn't mean it's, it, it happens, like, as sure as night follows day. It, it's a target. If there is some calamity in the, in the world that interrupts the supply chain, then it will be less. But the contracts that we have with cell suppliers fall for roughly a doubling of, of cell supply to Tesla in 2022. And we have to juggle these exponential, it's a whole bunch of exponential graphs sort of overlaid on top of each other. Small changes in where, where you are on the x-axis of time uh, can quite substantially change the area under the curve. What, we, what we're thinking of doing is like, it's, it's basically overshooting on cell supply for vehicles and then and as, if, if, as we have, say, excess cell supply in one month or another, then routing that cell output to the mega pack and power wall. Or by the same token, if you know, we're, we're prioritizing vehicle production, if there's, a, if, if there's a shortage of cell output for some reason, then we will throttle down mega pack and power wall production. So that we, something's got to give, basically. Or if there's a disruption to vehicle production, yes. we have a, a, an outlet for it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's, there's, there's a tremendous amount of inertia in the supply chain. So if we say to a supplier, we want you to double sell output, well, even doing that in a year is very difficult. And then that system has a tremendous amount of momentum. It is like a flotilla of super tankers. So <laughs> it's insane. Speaking of which, from a raw materials perspective, we, we also have long-term contracts to secure our supply chain to also enable this growth. So we're, we're not just looking at the suppliers, but upstream from there. Yeah, exactly. Which is more flotilla. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. As mentioned, things will move as fast as the slowest part of the entire supply chain, which goes all the way back to you know raw materials, you know lithium and nickel and that kind of thing. There's sometimes mis misperception that Tesla uses a lot of cobalt, but we actually don't. A Apple uses, uh, I think, almost 100% co uh, cobalt in, in their batteries and cell phones and, and laptops, uh, but Tesla uses no cobalt in the iron phosphate packs and uh, almost almost none in the nickel-based chemistries. So on a weighted average basis, we, we might use 2% cobalt compared to, say, Apple's 100% cobalt. Anyway, so it's just it's, it's really just not a factor. We, we expect basically 
uh, have zero cobalt in the future. I think probably there is a long-term shift uh, more in the direction of iron-based lithium-ion cells over nickel. As the energy density of sort of iron, or it's called typically iron phosphate, uh, but you might, you might as well just call it iron, the phosphate is not <laughs> taken for granted. But so iron-based cells, lithium-ion cells, and nickel-based lithium-ion cells, um, I think probably we'll see a shift. My guess is probably to two-thirds uh, iron, one-third nickel, or something on that order. And uh, this is actually good because there's plenty of iron in the world. There's an insane amount of iron. But nickel is, there's much less nickel, and there's way less cobalt. It is good for relieving the long-term scaling to move to iron-based cells uh, mostly. And I think long-term, uh, possibly all, there's a good chance that all um, stationary storage that is Powerwall and Megapack moves to iron. This is most likely the case uh, since you do not need to transport it and there's less of volume of mass constraint for stationary storage. So then nickel would be for, uh, really for long-range road transport, ships and aircraft and that kind of thing. Let's go to the second question from retail, which is, Elon has said that Tesla will be op- uh, opening up the supercharger network to other EVs later this year. Can you share some more details on how this will be structured? Will this be a select brands or will they contribute to the, to the growth of this network? Yes, yeah, we're currently thinking it's a real simple thing where you just download the Tesla app and you go to a supercharger and you just indicate which store you're in. So you, you plug in your, your car, even if it's not a Tesla, and then you just access the app and say, turn on the store that I'm in for how much electricity. And this should basically work with almost any manufacturer's cars, there will be a time constraint. So if the charge rate is, is super slow, then uh, somebody will be charged more because the, the biggest constraint at the superchargers is time, you know, how, how occupied is the stall. And we'll, we'll also be smarter with how, how we charge for electricity at the superchargers. So, you know, rush hour charging will be more expensive than off hours charging because there are times when the superchargers are empty and times when they're jam-packed. And so it makes sense to have some time-based uh, discrimination Awesome. Yeah, we've yeah. been doing that and it's been working and people yeah. respond and it helps with utilization. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think we're in, in, in Europe and China and most parts of the world, it's, a, it's the same connector for everyone. Um, so this is a fairly easy thing to do. Uh, developed our own connector, which in my opinion is actually uh, the best connector. It's, it's small and light, looks good, standard. So we developed our own connector, which in my opinion is actually uh, the best connector. So the, the, an adapter is needed to work for EVs in, in North America, but people can buy this adapter and we uh, anticipate having it available at the superchargers as well uh, if people don't, don't sort of steal them or something. <laughs> we have a good solution for that. Okay. <laughs> you know, that, that is just a, that's a constraint on the North American thing. Yeah. That's, that's basically a vestige of history. But I think we, we do want to emphasize that it, it is, our goal goal is to uh, support the advent of sustainable energy. Uh, it is not to create a walled garden and use that to bludgeon our competitors, <laughs> which is sometimes used by some companies. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> I think it's also important to comment that uh, increasing the, the utilization of the network actually reduces our cost, which allows us to lower charging prices for all customers, makes the network more profitable, allows us to grow the network faster. So that's a good thing there. And no matter what, we're going to continue to aggressively expand the network capacity, increasing charging speed, improving the trip planning tools to protect against site congestion using dynamic pricing, as Elon mentioned, yeah. and just continue to focus on minimum wait time for all customers. Yeah, obviously, in order for this to, to be for the supercharger to be useful to to other car companies, cars, we need to grow the network uh, faster than we're growing vehicle output, yep. which is not easy. We're growing vehicle output at a at a hell of a rate, <laughs> so superchargers need to grow faster than vehicle output. So this is a lot of work for the supercharger team, but it is only useful in, in the grand scheme of things. It's only useful to the public if we're able to grow faster than Tesla vehicle output. But that is our goal. And, and the third question is, Elon said 4680 cells aren't reliable enough for vehicles. Is this referring to cycle life, degradation, or something else? Please update us on progress of 4680s and what is still needs to be done to make them reliable enough for vehicles. Really, this is not... We'll definitely make the 4680 uh, reliable enough for vehicles. And we, I think are at the point where in limited volume, it is reliable enough for vehicles. Yeah. Again, going back to like, you know, limited production is easy or prototype production is easy, but high volume production is hard. There are a number of challenges in, in transitioning from small scale production to a, a large volume production. Not, not to get too much into the weeds of things, but r- right now we have a challenge with basically the what's called calendaring or, or basically squashing the cathode material to a, 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 a particular height. So it just goes through these rollers and gets and gets squashed like like pizza dough basically, <laughs> uh, and but very hard pizza dough and. 
it, it's causing, it's, it's denting the calendar rolls. This is not something that, that happened when the calendar rolls were smaller, <laughs> but it is happening when the calendar rolls were bigger. <laughs> so just like, uh, we're like, okay, we weren't expecting that. Yeah. It's not, it's not a like science problem. It's an engineering problem. It's yeah, not a question yeah. of if, it's a question of when, and the yeah. team is 100% focused on, on resolving these limiting processes as quickly as possible. Exactly. On the reliability side, as Elon mentioned, we have successfully validated performance and the lifetime uh, durability of the 4680 cells produced with Cato. And we're continuing ongoing verification of that reliability. We're actually accruing over 1 million equivalent miles on our cells that we produce every month in, in our testing activities. As, you know, The focus on that is very clear. We want high quality cells for all of our customers. And yeah, we're just focused on the unlucky limiting steps in the, in the, in the facility. And with the engineers focused on those few steps remaining, we're going to break through as you know as fast as possible. In the meantime, we're, we're you know we have a, a massive amount of equipment on order and arriving for the, the high volume uh, cell production in uh, Austin and Berlin. But, but obviously, given what we've learned uh, with the pilot plant, which is in Fremont, which is really quite a big plant by by most standards, we will have to modify a bunch of that equipment. You know, it won't be able to start like immediately. But it seems like I mean, do correct me if I'm wrong, but like we think. Most likely, we will hit an annualized rate of 100 gigawatt hours a year sometime next year. We'll have all the equipment installed yeah. to accomplish uh, 100 gigawatt hours, and it's, it's possible yeah. uh, that by the end of the year, we will be at an annualized rate of 100 gigawatt hours by yeah. the end of the year. I mean, my guess is more likely than not, above 50% of, of reaching 100 gigawatt hours a year by the end of next year on an annualized rate, something like that. Yep. But it could shift by a little bit. Uh, yeah. But it's and like nothing, as Drew mentioned, it's nothing fundamental, No. just a lot of work. Yeah, and, and even to the large roller question, Elon, right? Like on the anode side, the large rollers work great, no concerns. And so we're just learning as we go. And the, the nice thing about having that facility, you know, on the fast track like we had it and we talked about it at, at Battery Day was really de-risking the, the big factories here. Um, yeah. That's what we've done. Um, and we've learned, learned a lot. And uh, with each successive iteration, the ramp up and the equipment installation will be faster and more stable. Yeah. And the last question from retail is from Emmett. Can Elon do an interview with one of our YouTube channels once or twice a year? I would nominate David Lee on investing or Rod Mauer's Tesla Daily channels as first possible candidates. Yeah, I guess I, 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 yeah, I'll do, do an interview. I mean, just bear in mind, like, if I'm doing interviews, then I, I, I can't do actual other work, you know, so... Uh, <laughs> I don't have so much time in the day, so, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it once. No, I'm, I won't do it annually, but I'll do it once. I think also, like, the, this is the, I wouldn't say the last time I'll do earnings calls, but this is the, I, I will no longer be default doing earnings calls. Obviously, I'll do the annual shareholder meeting, but I think uh, going forward, I, I will most likely not be on earnings calls unless there's something really important that I need to say. Now let's go to institutional questions. The first one, can you please update us on timelines for the start of production of Berlin and Austin Model Y, Cybertruck, and the Semi? Do you expect the ramp of Cybertruck to be as difficult as it is a new process? I think Cybertruck ramp will be difficult because it's such a new architecture. I mean, it's going to be a great product. It might, I think, be our best product ever, but it, there's a lot of fundamentally new design ideas. Cybertruck, nobody's ever really made a car like this before, a vehicle like this before, so there'll probably be challenges because there's so much uh, unexplored Territory. Thank you. I think question two and question three we can skip uh, given we have already addressed it. So I'll go to question four. In five years' time, how much faster or better could you be at manufacturing capacity expansion using cut and paste? And what are the biggest issues you need to solve to get to that rate? Like I said, uh, I think we might be the, the fastest growing company in history for any large manufactured item. Those who have not actually been involved in the manufacturing ramp have just no idea how painful and difficult it is. You've got to eat a lot of glass and uh, for our manufacturing ramp, it's hard. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, if you look at the expansion we've done in Shanghai, you know, that, that factory was built in less than a year and ramped in, you know, five to six months to full volume. When you no, consider no, cut that. Two months than that, by, by a year. And when you consider cut and paste, we've repeated that, you know, in, in, in Fremont and whatever. But now with Berlin and Austin, we have new uh, factories and new designs. And so there's always challenges, as you, as you said, Elon, with, with new designs and ramping that. But I think having teams in three locations or three continents will definitely expand our ability and our capacity to grow more lines rather than just having the one uh, factory in Fremont that we had you know, a year and a half ago. Uh, so, I mean, for Shanghai, it was incredible that the team built both the factory in 11 months, but it took longer than it, longer than building the factory. It, it, it took longer than that to actually reach volume production, high volume production. It took about a year. And, and it, when you 
when you put a factory in a new geography, in order for that factory to be efficient, you have to localize the supply chain. It's, there's no such thing as cut and paste. It does not exist. And that, you know, it would obviously be insane to do vehicle production in Europe but send vast numbers of parts from North America. That would be that, that, that would make the you know producing in Europe, for example, just crazy. You, you've got to localize the supply chain to have efficiency, and then you, you're moving as fast as, as your least lucky, uh, least good supplier. It's only the supply chains where you go like, you know, three or four layers deep. It's uh, frankly, I feel at times that we are inheriting all force majeure of, of Earth. So if anything goes wrong anywhere on Earth, something happens to mess up the supply chain. I think the human capital, the human capital growth, though, of having factory here, Berlin, Shanghai, Fremont, does allow us to maybe not exponentially grow, but well, hopefully we are exponentially growing. Yeah, hopefully maintain that exponential growth. Yeah, it, it's also it takes a, a while to hire all the people and train all the people to operate the factory. A factory is like a giant cybernetic collective, and you can't just hire 10,000 people and have them have it work instantly. It's not possible. I really encourage more people to get involved in manufacturing. I think, especially in the U.S., like this has just not been an area where you know all that many smart people have gone into. I think the U.S. has an overallocation of talent in finance and law. It's both a criticism and a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying we shouldn't have people in finance and law. I'm just saying if this might be, maybe we have too many smart people <laughs> in those arenas. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> manufacturing's fun. Yeah, manufacturing is great. It's a very interesting problem to solve, and uh, obviously you can't ha have stuff unless someone makes it. <laughs> That's how you get stuff. And let's go to the last in investor question. Uh, does Tesla plan to offer more services beyond FSD or high-speed connectivity as part of its subscription bundle going forward? What areas in particular present an opportunity? Yeah, we don't have a lot of ideas on this, to be frank. <laughs> really, uh, full self-driving is the main thing. You know, things are obviously headed towards, uh, you know, a full fully autonomous electric vehicle future. And I think Tesla is well positioned and, and frankly is, is the leader objectively in, this, in both of those arenas, uh, electrification and autonomy. There's always, it's always tempting to try to find analogies, you know, with other companies or whatever, but really the value of a fully electric autonomous fleet is insanely gigantic, boggles the mind really. So that will be one of the most valuable things that is ever done in the history of civilization. And now let's go back to analyst Q&A, please. Our first question comes from Colin Rush with Oppenheimer. Your line is open. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Can you speak to the, the attach rates for FSD uh, so far and, and where you're targeting in terms of the subscription levels? Uh, it, it's not worth commenting on right now. It's not meaningful. We really need both up driving, at least the, the beta to be in wide, widely available so that anyone who wants it can get it. it otherwise, it would be pointless to, to read anything into where things are right now. Okay, and, and then just the, the follow-up there is about the, the, the cadence of the regulatory environment keeping up with the technology. You know, are you seeing meaningful evolution in terms of the regulators really understanding the technology and, and beginning to set some standards here sometime in the near term? At least in um, the U.S., we, we, we don't see regulation as a fundamental limiter. We've, got to, we've obviously got to make it work and then demonstrate that the reliability is significantly in excess of the average human driver for it to be allowed, you know, for, for, for people to be able to use it without uh, paying attention to the road. Uh, but we, I think we, we have a massive fleet, so it will be, I think, uh, straightforward to make the argument on statistical grounds, just based on the number of inter interventions, you know, or especially interventions that would result in a crash at scale, it will have billions of miles of travel to be able to show that the safety of the car with the autopilot on is you know, 100% or 200% or more safer than the average human driver. At that point, I think it would be unconscionable to not to allow the autopilot because it, the car just becomes way less safe. It would be sort of like, if you take the elevator analogy, back in the day, you used to have elevator elevator operators uh, with like a big sort of switch that, that and they're, they operate the elevator and, and move between floors, but uh, you know that, that get tired or, or maybe drunk or something or distract distracted, and every now and again somebody would be kind of shared in half between floors. That's kind of the situation we have with cars. Autonomy will become so safe that it will be unsafe to manually operate the, the car. Relatively speaking, you know today uh, obviously we just get in an elevator, we press the button for which floor we want, and it just takes us there safely. And it would, it would be quite alarming if it was elevators were operating operated by a person with a giant switch. Uh, that's how it will be with cars. Next question comes from Ladoichi with Wolf Research. Your line is open. Your your cost of goods sold per vehicle is already down to the mid-$37,000 range in the quarter. It's 
uh, it's down $5,000 year over year, despite some of the inefficiencies that, that you talked about. And I know that a lot uh, is going to change from here, just given how mix is going to evolve. But if you're successful on the structural pack and front and rear castings and the launch of the 4680 cell, can you just maybe give us a sense of what a successful outcome would look like maybe a year from now? Um, obviously, a lot has to go right, but just any any kind of uh, broad framework for us to think about. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult for us to, we, we, to to make specific predictions. It's very difficult. I think you know we feel confident of you know at, say at least a fifty percent growth year over year next year, um, and and maybe it's a hundred percent. But that's we, we, uh, you need a lot of crystal balls to figure out exactly what it's going to be, and we just it is literally impossible to make a specific prediction. But you know. At least 50, maybe 100, something like that. Just separately from this, can you just clarify what the status is of uh, some of the advances in in battery manufacturing, uh, things like dry cathode mixing that that you talked about on on, uh, battery day? Uh, What's the timeline? How how are those uh, evolving? Yeah, Yeah, we we commented on it today already, actually. But, you know, in the... In the facility at Cato, over 90% of the, the like processes have demonstrated rate there, but we are limited by the unlucky few that have not, and that's what we're working on. Uh, one of them that Elon mentioned was running the, the full-scale cathode calendar. Uh, we're, we're working through some improvements that we need to make to that equipment and to the, the actual raw material itself to, to not have those limitations. But again, it's an engineering problem. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. On the mixing side, we haven't actually really had any challenges specific to your question. And uh, fundamentally, we're still happy with the, the dry process direction in terms of the factory footprint, complexity, utility consumption, space, and overall complexity simplification. Yeah. And I mean, and the cost associated with everything that I just Yeah. But, and, and if you don't have overemphasized dry cathode, I mean, it's, it is a, I don't know, maybe it's like 10 or 15% of the cost improvement or something like that. I don't know, 20% maybe? Oh, over oh, oh yeah. 10, 10. 10, 10 Closer to 10. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's like just, just like people don't think like this is like the Messiah or something. You know, wet versus dry <laughs> reduces to dry is like 10 percent less cost than wet. <laughs> so it's not, um, you know, not 10 percent. You know, still nothing to sneeze at, um, especially if you're making you know hundreds of gigawatt hours a year. But it's not, it's not the Messiah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Next question comes from Pierre Ferragu with New Street Research. Your line is open. Hey, thanks. Um, thanks very much for taking my question. I have another question actually on batteries, but uh, on a slightly, slightly different angle. I was wondering how um, you're looking at your sourcing strategy for the 4680. You've talked a lot about all the work you're doing to develop your in-house production. Uh, but what about asking other battery manufacturers to do 4680 cells with their own technology? maybe less uh, less innovation than uh, what you guys are lining up internally. And and I was wondering if the first 4680 cell that we'll see uh, on the road will definitely come from Tesla's own manufacturing uh, lines or whether they could be coming actually from outside suppliers as well. Uh, yeah, we, we are in fact uh, working with our existing suppliers to produce 4680 uh, format cells. You know, it, it, this is just a guess right now, but I, you know, I, I see a sort of like consolidating around a 4680 nickel base, a structural pack for, for long range vehicles, and then uh, not necessarily a, a 4680 format, but some other format for uh, iron based cells. And so we, 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 right now, we, we kind of have the Baskin Robbins of batteries situation <laughs> where there's, <laughs> we have so many formats and, and so many chemistries that it's uh, like we've got like 36 flavors of a battery at this point. You know, this is just, this, this results in an, an engineering drag coefficient um, where each variant of cell chemistry and format requires a certain amount of engineering to maintain it and troubleshoot, and, um, and this inhibits our forward progress. So it is going to be important to consolidate to just maybe ideally two form factors, maybe three, but, but ideally two, and then just uh, you know one, one nickel chemistry and one iron chemistry. So uh, we don't have to, to troubleshoot so many different variants. Yeah, and towards that end, we're, we are engaging with the suppliers that we've had good partnerships with on 4680 designs to enable that simplification. And you know, so so far so good. You know, they're working on they're bringing their core competencies to bear on that. We're not mandating like what's going on inside, but but uh, it, it's been a good, good collaboration. Yeah, you know, and, and we we do expect to see you know significant increases in supply from our existing suppliers in addition to the the cells that Tesla is making. So 
It's both. You know, sometimes I get questions from our cell suppliers of like, are we just going to make all the cells ourselves? And we're like, no, please make as many as you possibly can and supply them to us. We, we have a significant unmet demand in stationary storage. Megapack is basically sold out through the end of next year, I believe. Yeah. We have a massive backlog in power wall demand. The demand of power wall versus production is an insane mismatch. Uh, now, part of that problem is also the semiconductor, the, yeah, the semiconductor issue. We, we, we use a lot of the same chips in the, in the power wall as we do in the car. So it's like, which one do you want to make, cars or power walls? So we we need to make cars, so therefore power wall production has, has been reduced. Uh, but as that semiconductor storage is alleviated, then we can massively ramp up power wall production. You know, I think we, we have a chance of, of hitting an annualized rate of, you know, a million units of power wall next year, uh, maybe, on the order of 20,000 a week. But again, dependent on cell supply and semiconductors. But in terms of demand, I think there's probably demand for in excess of a million power walls per year. And and, and, and a, actually just a vast amount of mega packs for utilities. Uh, as the world transitions to a sustainable sustainable energy production, solar and wind are intermittent and by their nature really need battery pack in order to provide a steady flow of electricity. And when you look at you know all the utilities in the world, this is a vast amount of back- batteries that are needed. That's why you know long term we really think combined Tesla and suppliers need to produce at least a thousand gigawatt hours a year, and maybe two thousand gigawatt hours a year. And I have a quick question. I know, uh, Elon, you you don't you, you don't think it's meaningful today, but I'd be curious to know, you know, if you have any stats about when you you announce a new pricing on a on a SSD moving from ten ground up front to one ninety nine without the lock in. I'd be curious to understand, you know, how it uh, affected behavior and if you saw like a massive effect taking the service uh, and. I'm not thinking about people looking at it as an SSD, but more, you know, to to try the most ad- advanced version of uh, autopilot and to um, and to try it. So in, in the first days, you've announced the pricing. Have you seen like a, a very significant spike in, uh, in in the tech rate? And can you get get us give us a sense of uh, how big it was? Okay, so you're, so you're asking like, is the FSD tech rate too expensive, and and that's why we're doing subscription? Or uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question correctly. No, my question is from the time you announced like the, the subscription at $199 per month, how, how much did like the tech rate increase? How, like, like the percentage of people who, who basically took uh, took the subscription as they bought a new car versus how it was when they had to pay 10 grand at front. Yeah, this is Zach here. I mean, I think we're still early in understanding how FSD subscription will unfold, but a couple of data points here. We took a look at our backlog to see, you know, of customers in our backlog who have ordered FSD, did they cancel, you know, presumably presumably to go to subscription after they take delivery. And the level of cancellations there was not seeing cannibalization there. It's possible that that changes, but that was also part of our pricing strategy at $99 and 199 Yeah, I mean, we, uh, you know, it's like any given price is going to be wrong. So we'll, we'll just adjust it over time as as we see, you know, the, the value proposition makes sense to people. We're just really, I'm not thinking about this a lot right now. Uh, we need to make full self-driving work in order for it to be a compelling value proposition. Otherwise, people are kind of betting on the future. I mean, right, like right now, is it, does it make sense for somebody to do an FSD subscription? I think it's debatable, but once we have full self-driving widely deployed, then the value proposition will be clear, and at that point, I think basically everyone will, will use it, or it will be rare, a rare individual who does it. I think that's all the time we have for today. Thanks for all your questions, and we'll speak to you again in three months' time. Have a good day, everyone. All right, thank you.